Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, listeners, to episode 49 of the Ad Nauseam Podcast. We are coming to you from the Vomitorium. We have uh, part two of a special episode featuring Dr. Patrick M. Owens from Hillsdale College. He's joining us tonight to discuss... Latin curricula. Latin curricula. Although That's he is correct. not in the Vomitorium with us tonight. He no, he was last time yep. in the Vomitorium. He had enough... He and made the rounds, but we're bringing him in remotely through the magic of the interwebs. And uh, before we get down to business, we have a shout out to give, don't we? We do. This goes to uh, Aaron Potter. I remember Aaron Potter. Do you I remember? don't. You don't no. remember Aaron Potter? Mm-mm. Aaron Potter and his brother, Ethan. I remember uh, Ethan. Yes. Uh, Aaron was, uh, he was a stalwart in a number of my classes. Mm. Um, loved the classics. Very engaged, interested student. Um he is now teaching at Kalamazoo Christian. Okay. Just down the road, a fur piece from the vomitorium here. Did uh, you say a fur piece? I, I, I regret saying is that Is that now. why you're wearing a hat? <laughs> Don't get me started, Hasselhoff. Okay. He says uh, he doesn't get to teach much in the way of classics at Kalamazoo Christian. He would love to teach more. He says he always teaches Oedipus Rex mm. in his World Lit class. And he says that his students are mostly horrified slash amused by that, uh, which he enjoys watching. Of course. Of course. Yeah, the yeah. discomfort of others is always uh, quite entertaining. Right. I, be- I remember reading uh, Oedipus the King in my mythology class with Aaron. With Mr. Potter. With Mr. Potter. Yep. Right. Well, we want to say thank you, Aaron, for being a loyal listener. And uh, keep the, the flame lit out there, we'd have to say. Yes, we really appreciate it. In the study of it. the classics and so forth. All right. Dave, you got an opening quote for I have today? an opening quote. This one is also from Basil Lino Gildersleeve, just like it was last time. And after uh, we give this quote, we're going to ask Dr. Owens, uh, Patty, as we like to call him, <laughs> uh, if he wants to weigh in on this. He probably just dropped off the call. Probably. When I said that. Right, right, right. All right. So here's uh, Basil Gildersleeve from his uh, Essays and Studies, Educational and Literary, 1890. He says, quote, grammatical study is in point of fact literary study and arises from the necessity of expounding to later generations some great work that has made its language the norm for the period or for the department, whereas for a long time the language of everyday life, this is the part I like, the language of everyday life resists the analysis. And one is astonished to see how many centuries of thought and controversy were needed to settle the categories that every schoolchild knows after a fashion. Hmm. So we're going to ask our esteemed guest. We're going to ask Patrick. Okay. If he'd like to interact with that quote, what does he think specifically about this portion of the quote, that the language of everyday life resists grammatical analysis? Hmm. Well, it's certainly true that quotidian language is more difficult to analyze according to the grammatical rules that we've developed to describe and categorize literary languages, specifically Latin and Greek. But I'm not Mm -hmm. sure that in any real sense, it resists linguistic analysis. What do you think? Well, what I what I like about this quote and why I chose it is because on the one hand, Gildersleeve is known as a paragon of grammatical knowledge. After all, I spent a great deal of time studying his grammar. Mm-hmm. But uh, in this quote, he he seems to be saying that grammar is in some ways an afterthought. It's it's really uh, designed for literary study. The necessity of expounding to later generations some great work that has made its language the norm. So, in other words, I interpret this to mean. A lot of people can use, speak, enjoy, manipulate, create within the language without understanding the grammar, but it's mostly after the fact that we need grammatical study. I thought this quote was apropos of our discussion last week in terms of the grammar translation method versus an inductive method for learning Latin. What do you think, Patrick? When it comes down to choosing an approach or a method for language instruction, the instructor has to decide whether it is the language that is the object of investigation and learning for some ends like uh, reading literature or appreciating the thinkers of that language, or whether the thing that's under investigation is is grammar for for grammar's sake. Hmm. I think uh, very often in the classics, it happens that students and, and perhaps instructors think that they're engaged in language learning when really they are engaged in learning about Mm -hmm. language or learning the nature of grammar. I see. I see. 
Is that is that your experience as well? Uh, my experience has been that even when I'm seeking to speak Latin, which as you know, I've been practicing for a long time, I tend to revert to the norms for teaching Latin that I use in English. So I've gotten fairly good at, at manipulating grammatical terminology within Latin. So I can talk about the cases and the forms and the tenses and the numbers and all that kind of stuff. But I don't really feel like I'm speaking Latin. I'm simply mm. mirroring my ability to manipulate grammatical categories uh, in English. I'm mirroring that in Latin. So I think I agree with your basic point. There are different kinds of skills. I mean, it's one of the things that Gildersleeve is saying in this in this quote is that uh, especially in terms of Latin and, uh, or ancient Greek, of getting back to tr some sort of, of being able to speak and understand the quotidian language of the day is impossible. Hmm. And that we have to have some sort of construct just to, to understand it on any kind of level. I mean, w I mean, what do you think Gildersleeve would say against through this quote about, you know, resurrecting spoken Latin and Greek? Would he say that's kind of a fool's game or? Right. Well, it's very easy to speculate since he's dead. He can't yeah. disagree with well, us. Well, we can speak for him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it does seem, based on the quote, I know Patrick has the quote in front of him too, that um, he's talking about the necessity of expounding to later generations. Mm. So grammar is needful because there's such a gap between how people really spoke then and right. what we know of their knowledge right, right, today. Right, 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 right. Yeah. yeah. Well, we can maybe leave that there and, and the, the listeners can pick it up. Unless I'm mistaken, though, Professor Gildersleeve was involved for at least a short period of time with Arcadius Evolanus, the famed proponent of active Latin hmm. and a contemporary of Professor Gildersleeve. Gildersleeve brought him from Pennsylvania to Columbia College where he was to give a lecture on his active Latin pedagogy. Hmm. Okay. I hadn't heard that story before. Um, what I knew of Gildersleeve is that he was at Johns Hopkins, but this was probably earlier in his career, hmm. as you're saying. Um, that, it'd, be, it'd be fascinating to find out how um, Gildersleeve appreciated spoken Latin. Perhaps a topic for another episode? Of course. Okay. Yes. We'll All right. Back. Yeah. So let's give a quick review of what we covered last week, because we have to say that despite our best intentions, the uh, last episode turned into a smash hit. Huge. Yes. Yes. Uh, Dr. Owens was just lighting up the Internet. People were downloading and listening to even individuals, Jeff, that I didn't think were interested in Latin pedagogy. We're tuning in for what's the best Latin textbook. Right. And which I, we're going to, are we going to try to, are we going to actually answer that question tonight? Well, we're not going to tell people till we get to the end of the episode. Okay. That might give me too much away. <laughs> give You're giving too much away. Sorry. I'm new, I'm new to this stuff. I, yeah. I, how did you feel about that title, Patrick? What's the best Latin textbook that was your, your title of choice? Well, I don't think I came up with it, did I? <laughs> no, you didn't. But <laughs> I'm, I'm throwing you a softball so you can scold me and say, I never meant to say. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> So last week we covered uh, Huilax and we covered uh, Moreland and Fleischer, uh, two of the deductive grammar translation method, and the text we're covering this evening. Oh, a lot of them. A well, lot of them. Well, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to look at uh, the trio of Collins, Scanlon, and Henley. Then we're going to move on to the Cambridge Latin course, the Oxford Latin course. We're going to talk about uh, Ossa Latinitatis. We'll probably take a, a side trip into Duolingo and Rosetta Stone, these mm -hmm. digital Latin learning programs. And we're going to end up with what is, as the listener knows, my favorite, and I believe, uh, I believe Patrick's as well, the uh, Orberg text, Familia Romana. Excellent. Excellent. How does that sound, Patrick? That sound like a, a good order for us to take these in? Yeah, is this show three hours long? I forget. Yeah. <laughs> it's like another Joe Joe Rogan? No, it just feels like it, that's all. Uh, more for the guests probably than for the audience. So let's start out with Collins, Scanlon, and Henley. And uh, Dr. Owens, can you tell us why did you suggest to group these three texts together? What was your thinking? Well, all of these texts profess to teach ecclesiastical or or church Latin or, or Latin for, for people interested in reading theology or, or even texts of the medieval period in Latin. Um, I, I say profess because I'm not sure how well they, they accomplish that. Uh, and so we'll talk about them separately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the, fir the first in the group is Collins's Ecclesiastical Latin. And okay. the, the title really sa says it all. I should I should say that I I was a student of 
Dr. Collins is. He was a Greek professor of mine at, at oh. City University in, in New York. And his book was written for the same sort of summer program as the Moreland and Fleischer text, mm-hmm. uh, intensive Latin. In fact, uh, Rita Fleischer um, was, was also there at, at CUNY while I, I was studying under uh, Dr. Collins. So I, I had the, the good fortune of getting to know Rita Fleischer, the, the author of, of that intensive textbook, and Dr. Collins. And while hmm. Dr. Collins was a, a fantastic intellect and a, a, a jolly classicist, a really fun person to study with, I'm not sure that his, uh, his textbook does well by his... His aims, maybe? Uh, you say he's a jolly classicist. So um, I think I'm often described that way. Maybe it's, yeah, maybe it's the wide black belt with the buckle. Maybe it's the red pants and the red coat. <laughs> maybe it's the fur trimmed hat. It's your uh, weight. Oh, 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 we're going, oh. oh, look, did you hear that? <laughs> yeah. Throw it down. Well, well, that wraps up this episode. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for tuning in. Yeah. <clears throat> no, anyway, right, so, okay. So let, let's get back to uh, Collins, yeah, so, right? So, so Collins, um, Dr. Collins. Collins, who also taught at the same program as uh, Moreland and Fleischer. Right. Composed this, this textbook as a, a remedy to what he saw in, in seminaries in the, mm. I guess, 70s and 80s, wherein... Okay. Uh, students were not learning Latin to any meaningful degree, such that they could read Latin uh, texts that were in, important for seminary studies. And so he and, thought, by writing this short shortcut, a a text that is analogous to the in, intensive uh, Latin text, that this would be a a way to aid hmm. those students, and and to a certain extent. You know, it it is. It provides students with a a very brief overview, very small amount of vocabulary. Okay, and and that's key, right? Because you you can't acquire a language without learning vocabulary. Right. So those textbooks that shelter vocabulary to such an extent that students walk away with with fewer than five hundred or fewer than a thousand mm. um, discrete vocabulary words. Right. They're not preparing students to to read, and I think that's the fundamental flaw of a textbook like Collins. Hmm. So Scanlon is the next one, and and this is one that I've taught out of a little bit. And um, if I'm remembering correctly, Patrick, refresh me and correct me if I'm wrong. The um, refresh my memory. The text has its goal of as teaching scholastic Latin. So the examples are drawn from the kinds of things one might find in Aquinas, for example, or perhaps occasionally in Anselm and uh, authors of that time period. Is, is, that, uh, is that how the text is designed? That's right. I, I'm not sure that it's specifically to scholastic Latin, but it's, it's geared especially to, toward uh, ecclesiastical Latin mm-hmm. to introduce students to reading important authors from the medieval period and, and afterwards. So you identified Anselm, Anselm and Aquinas. And I think both mm-hmm. of those, those authors are represented there. There are large selections from codes of canon law, mm. selections from, um, from parts of the, the Catholic mass. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't remember any literary Latin in the work. Is that correct? That's right. If, if, if one doesn't, doesn't catalog uh, those philosophers like Anselm or mm-hmm. Aquinas as as literature, and and obviously that is a conversation for another show. Right. Uh, I, I think Latin literature is underrepresented in the textbook, mm-hmm. and literary style, um, certainly poetic vocabulary, is underrepresented. And so, with with that comes the problem that. Uh, a student who works all the way through Scanlon and Scanlon m- might conceivably be prepared to read some straightforward scholastic texts, uh, maybe some medieval Latin prayers or ecclesiastical Latin prayers, but but it is really not prepared to go forth and and uh, as as we see in Augustine, tole lege. You know that's that's just that's not possible. That is to say. One couldn't finish that text and then pick up Cicero or Caesar or, or even right. Augustine, uh, who's who's a more or less a, an early medieval 
author hmm. or or Leo or Gregory or dozens of other fantastic medieval authors. There's just not a lot of depth there. Okay. I'm curious, uh, uh, Patrick or, or David, if you know that if um, uh, the Collins text or any of these more ecclesiastical texts were written in response to maybe shrinking Latin requirements at at seminaries and say, uh. so instead of taking, you know, the, the, the requisite, you know, four semesters here, um, here's your summer study, get it done, crank it out, right. get it done. I, I'm just curious. Bypassing uh, the cursus literarum. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really interesting question. Uh, it's not so much that there was a, a decreasing requirement in say seminaries and, and almost all these texts under consideration right here are, are written by Catholics and they're written for mm. Catholic seminaries. Okay. So, um, it, in the case of Scanlon and Scanlon, um, they're responding, I believe, not to the decrease in requirements, but rather to the decrease in ability when students are are entering mm. the the level where inquiry oh, gotcha. requirements um, are are more carefully maintained. In um, in 1964. Pope John the 23rd signed into law an important document known as Veterum Sapientia, that is uh, the wisdom of the ancients in mm. a form of, uh, in, a, in a legal format known as an encyclical. And uh, I'm sorry, it was not an encyclical, it was an apostolic exhortation in, in the form of an apostolic exhortation. That was close. Oh, which, my God, that was so close. Which required <laughs> he that... almost confused an encyclical with an apostolic exhortation. <laughs> well, there are differences, David. <laughs> I know, but we should, we would have really heard it. So yeah, I know, I, Cint- I know I, Centesim is on us, but go ahead. I, I don't want people, uh, angry listeners, writing in. Oh, I completely agree. You know how pedantic I am about technicality, so you just go right on. But okay, so that that document required that all seminarians learn to read and write and speak Latin fluently before hmm. they begin studying philosophy, oh. which was a prerequisite to studying theology. So that is to say, this law enshrined an expectation that students in intending Mm. to stand for the Catholic priesthood would really know Latin. Mm. It also defined a very long reading list, uh, an excellent reading list that um, I would, I would bet most PhD students in the classics today uh, don't, don't fulfill. That is it's, it's longer and more extensive in both the the pagan and Christian authors. Mm. In any case, um, this was sort of impracticable because students leaving high school in the in the early and mid '60s were no longer prepared to to fulfill the the requirements that would be prerequisites for any any sort of course like that, and so I, there was a, a flurry of texts, that is a flurry of textbooks, that attempted to bridge that gap. Mm-hmm. And these uh, fell in, into that into that and, hole and more or less Co- Collins to a, a lesser extent. Collins comes okay. later, and um, it's a little bit more pessimistic at that time. There's no realistic expectation that anyone is going to learn to read, write, and speak Latin in the hmm. seminaries in the 70s and 80s. Let's go on to Henley if we can uh, for just a moment. And I just I have a question here. There are a lot of homeschool students in the United States that are using the Henley text. And uh, I'm a Protestant. Um, Jeff's Protestant. Mm-hmm. Our friend uh, Patrick is a Catholic. The Henley text, it always surprises me, Patrick, that so many of these homeschool kids are using it because uh, most of them that I know are Protestants. But the some of the Latin exempla in the text um, have kind of language that is, I think, quite explicitly Catholic that um, I think a lot of Protestants would be at least somewhat uncomfortable with. Are, are you familiar with, with what I'm saying? You, you think that's a fair I assessment? I am. And every year I have students come to the university level right. who have spent four, six, eight years with Henley. Mm. I'm aware that there are at least two different versions of the okay. Henley texts. One version is avowedly more religious or more more christian in tone okay. and and another version is very toned down hmm. where 
many of the exemplar, perhaps the very ones that you have in mind, right, have been expunged, right, in an attempt to make it more digestible to public school institutions, oh. and and in fact, it it, it has been used in, in public schools, hmm. but it is widely used among homeschoolers, right, and I think that's because it was adopted by Memoria Press. Mm-hmm. as a viable option, perhaps also a, a number of other uh, homeschool options like um, classical conversations, I believe. Right. Is it? Yes. Yep. Is it, bro- is it broader in scope than, than well, it, Collins and Scanlon? I or? think it has selections from Caesar. It has some okay. some decent present. I've never taught from it, to be frank. I've mm-hmm. only read through it and, and uh, studied it a little bit. Yeah. So my impression, Patrick, you can correct me, is that it is fairly broad, um, I have some other criticisms of it, but what, yeah. what do you think, Patrick? That's right. It's it's very broad. And and someone who finishes the four volumes of Henley of, of either version would be really well prepared to continue reading Caesar and perhaps read Cicero and or Virgil. By the end of the fourth volume, students have read long and large selections of text. That text is slightly adulterated and is annotated heavily, but they've seen a lot of Latin. And so while I have some qualms about the way that the language is presented there, and while it may not be my, my favorite text, mm-hmm. a student who works diligently through the series will be able to make great progress in the learning of the language. Mm. I would say something very similar about Huilak, which we discussed last week. <laughs> I would make a very similar statement as as you just made about Henley. Did you want to say anything else about this category, or shall we move on to uh, the Oxbridge editions, as we call them, the Cambridge Latin course and the Oxford Latin course? Well, just before we transition, I, I'd like to point out that although these textbooks are self-described ecclesial ecclesiastical Latin primers, and maybe a little bit less, maybe that's a little bit less true regarding Henley. They perpetuate this idea, especially in the minds of of homeschooled students and homeschooling parents, that there's a great divide between ecclesiastical Latin or or church Latin or medieval Mm -hmm. Latin and whatever else is out there, classical Latin. Mm -hmm. So it it happens not infrequently that people will ask me whether I teach ecclesiastical Latin or (laughs) classical Latin. And I am perplexed and I say, say Latin. Yes. Really, it, it is one language. There are certainly dialects within sure. any language, especially a language that has existed for as long as Latin has. There are quirks that are notable about medieval Latin, and there's, there's vocabulary that's specific to church or ecclesiastical Latin. But I wouldn't want any of your, your audience members to leave thinking that that division is anything other than a, a difference without a meaning. Hmm. Patrick, how would you compare the, that difference to, say, the difference between uh, Koine and Attic Greek? Right. We, we can sit down and come up with, uh, with ways of describing Koine. We can say, for instance, and, and for, for our listeners who may not be familiar, Koine Greek is the, the, the common dialect uh, in which the New Testament is written and, and hundreds of other important texts. And it differs from other dialects, namely the Attic dialect, in that it has perhaps fewer fewer anomalies and it has um, it has maybe its edges polished off a little mm-hmm. bit, so to speak. And the, the analogy, while helpful at first glance, doesn't really hold with me- medieval Latin because we can describe the the grammar and the syntax of of Koine and how it's different. For instance, the thing that people point out immediately with Koine is that there's no optative or there's very very limited optative right. mood. Right. Um, some of the adverbs are used differently. Uh, cer- certain pronouns have re- remarkably different forms. Uh, that's not the case in medieval Latin. And in fact, medieval Latin or ecclesiastical Latin doesn't have any parameters. So if we look at a an author like Leo the Great and look at his, his homilies, there's nothing that we can say that's specific about mm-hmm. his Latinity or uh, Paulus de Canus or um, even Bernardus of Clairvaux. 
mm-hmm. we we can't identify things that are specific to their language and syntax. We can say uh, these authors are talking about something that Cicero didn't know about, namely about Christ and about a church, and they're living in a different so- socio political world than that which Cicero would recognize. But once Cicero got over the the strange topics, he really wouldn't have a d- hmm. difficulty understanding most ecclesiastical hmm. authors. Hmm. All right. Well, thank you, Patrick. That's a, an excellent summary of that set of texts. We're going to look at the Cambridge Latin course and the Oxford Latin course after the break. This episode of Ad Nauseam is brought to you by Racial Coffee. Racial Coffee. I took my time saying that. Yes, you did. Because you were just contemplating the great cup of coffee you had this morning? I was sipping it as we, as we thought. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what's going on here? <laughs> Racial Coffee, ladies and gentlemen of Portland, Oregon, uh, my good friend Mark Helweg and his team have solved all of your brew-based and aesthetic problems when it comes to a cup of coffee. Not some of them, all of them. All of them. Yep. There's no need to go down to the, the bagel barn, the brew. The bagel barn and beanery. And beanery, mm-hmm. uh, because you can do it right on your kitchen counter. That's yep. right. No more mass brew-deuced coffee. No. Stay away from that. No more pulling a cup off of that scorchy under pad. No. There's no need for one in, the, uh, in these beautiful machines. I have the ratio six. You've got the six. You've got the eight. Can you describe uh, the ratio six for our listeners in poetic terms? It's a beautiful, sleek machine. It's more of a work of art than it is a coffee maker, although it makes it makes wonderful coffee too. Mm-hmm. Um, it outclasses everything else in my kitchen. It's got the stainless steel carafe, which keeps everything nice and toasty for a really long time. Mm-hmm. So there's no need for that scorching burner. There's off gassing the, of the harsh. Uh, Carbon dioxide. Yep, that takes place in the bloom stage. In the bloom stage, yeah. when the the coffee comes down through the Fibonacci head. Yeah, does that happen in your in your eight too? Oh, of course. Yes, okay. that's the hallmark. You might say the signature of all of Ratio's products. The uh, the off gassing. That's correct. Yes. <laughs> That's what they'd like to be known for in the industry when they show up at conventions. And you're the, oh, oh those, those are the off gassers. Those are the off gassers over there. Yeah, you can't argue with the with the quality. No. Um, every morning I look forward to it. Hit the button. It's part of your ritual. Bloom stage. Brew stage ready. Boom. Yep. There's a good cup of coffee. Right there for you. Yes. So yep. what can our listeners do if they would like to join um, the Brewvolution? The bre- <laughs> get- I love it. Join the Brewvolution. You go to racialcoffee.com. Okay. And you can, uh, if you punch in the, 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 coupon, the code. coupon code ANCO. That's right. I believe. Ad nauseum and coffee. And co. Yes. And they will get, uh, is it, um, how much off? It's 15%. 15% off. The ratio, the ratio six, six. the yep. machine I've got. Yep. We're working on a ratio eight promotional at some point, but the, the machines are just so popular yes. that they just can't really keep them in stock. But you can get a ratio six yes. in a variety of colors. They've got uh, black, uh, matte, right? Stainless steel. That's and the one white. I've got. It's beautiful. Gorgeous yep. machines. Yep. Ratiocoffee.com, R A T I O coffee.com. Check it out. Do it. This episode of Ad Nauseam also brought to you by Hackett Publishing. Hackett Publishing, based in Indianapolis, Indiana, and also in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. They've been uh, producing for the last 40 plus years high quality, affordable translations of uh, the works from classical antiquity as well as many other subject areas across the humanities. Um, I love them. I've used them in classes. I have them on my shelf at home. Um, I can't say enough about how much I like uh, uh, what I find at Hackett Publishing. What about you, Dave? Well, I like everything, honestly. They have great translations. I've used a number of them. Plato, Descartes, Aristotle, the Nicomachean Ethics. It's a great translation. They have new offerings on Aristotle. Their their new series. They have Len Krizak's translation of the Aeneid. I also love the Lingua Latina Per Se Illustrata. I've used it at a number of different levels for my own children, um, in primary schools, at the university level. It's just a great series. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I love their translation. I've used the Lombardo um, Odyssey translation for years in my myth classes. Um, the Their translation of the Bacchae is, is great. The artwork is great. I love that you can you can get their stuff uh, uh, um, digitally through Red Shelf. That's right. Um, they, these guys have been with us from the beginning. And they've been so helpful and um, supportive along the way. And we'd love for you guys to support them too. Hope. Yes. And and how can they benefit, Dave? Well, they need to go to hackettpublishing.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll spell the dot com part first. C-O-M. <laughs> keep it easy. Yes. Then hackett, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, E-T-T, publishing.com. Find the texts you want, the things, are, the books, the volumes that are going to help take your 
uh, your classical studies to the next level, put them in the shopping cart. Yep. When you get to the part where you need the coupon code, you're going to want to use AN2021. That's right. And Jeff, what do they get? They get uh, a couple of great benefits. They get 20% off. Oh, drop the mic. I know. No, the, the kids hang on to the mic. <laughs> okay. Drop it in a second. 20% off anything they order and free shipping. Uh, that's incredible. Yep. Phenomenal. Yep. It's great stuff. Check it out. Today's episode is also brought to you by Ad Astra Roasters. Ad Astra is a veteran-owned specialty coffee roaster located in Hillsdale, Michigan. Founded in Kansas in 2018, Ad Astra Roasters takes its name from the Kansas State motto, Ad Astra per Aspera, to the stars through adversity. I love Ad Astra beans, the, the stuff that they've sent us. Um, the Tenebrise blend is, is still my favorite. Uh, Dave, what do you like that from? I love the Tenebris. I also like the Las Lajas Micro a lot. There's one more that I know. That yeah, the Hue really Hue Tenango. Yeah, that's going to set you up for that. Right? Yeah, I love that one. Let's tango with the Hue Hue Tenango. Yeah, it's great stuff. Uh, the poetry series is also a really great option for those wanting uh, to read a great uh, poem while drinking even better coffee. And listeners, uh, head to adastraroasters.com, A-D-A-S-T-R-A roasters.com, and you get 10% off when you put in the coupon code A-N-A-A at checkout. Absolutely. Check it out. All right. So as we get back into it, um, we promised our listeners a look at the Cambridge Latin course and the Oxford Latin course. And um, I don't know, Patrick, can you just start us off with a, your overall opinion of, of, of both of these these texts? You know, how, did, how do they compare to some of the stuff we talked about last week? Wheelock, Moreland Fleischer, where would you rank these guys? So the, the Oxford, by, by which we mean the Oxford and the Cambridge texts are similar. Mm-hmm. Not only did they come into into production or not only were they published around the same time, but they have the same approach. It's what's called a, a reading approach. And the reading approach offers students an opportunity to see the, the language in action, to see the vocabulary that they're learning, the new grammar that's been proposed in a format that is narrative. So there's a narrative structure. You have a main character. The main character could be Horace or he could be a character from Pompeii. And the the idea is that there's a certain amount of buy-in on the part of the the student. The student gets engaged in the narrative and is carried along through the harder parts of language study through the, the hook of uh, having a narrative structure to the book. These books are are generally intended for middle school and high school students. Rarely have I seen them employed in higher ed, although I know that they they are in some places. And they do a great job of making the language accessible to students who maybe in a middle school or high school have Latin two or three times a week for an hour. Um, they're they're always engaging pictures. Uh, these texts also in, include a lot of cultural information. So in every chapter, there's there's a culture section in which the historical facts of, of the ancient world and of ancient Rome are are taught in a in usually an engaging or in, interesting way. Okay, and I think in the um, in the Cambridge Latin course, correct me if I'm wrong, it's loosely based on. Uh, Horace, the poet Horace, Quintus Ratis Flaccus, and his interaction with his um, his pedagogue, right? Uh, a man named Orbilius. And I believe that Horace said of him that he was plagosis, which, <laughs> which means uh, always quick with a beating. Isn't that correct? <laughs> That's right. That's right. You don't get that impression from the textbook. Okay. The textbook <laughs> makes uh, Horace out to be an easygoing fellow and his, his, his teacher is too. Hmm. Uh, I, I will say of both these texts, but more specifically of the Cambridge texts, the, the color picture, pictures, although they might be interesting to younger students, they're really terrible pictures. I mean, they're, hmm. they're, they're awful. If, if I'm not mistaken, the artist of the Cambridge textbook is related to the main editor uh, and so there's a little bit of nepotism there. And one, one would uh, maybe posit that the artist would not have gotten the job and hmm. might have been hard up for work, if not related to a classicist who could make that happen. Right. It wasn't their best decision, though, because uh, it does mar the text quite a bit. Another yeah, drawback of that specific text is that there is much less Latin than there is English in every oh, chapter. Right. So for every, say, 
page of, of English, there's less than half a page of Latin. So mm -hmm. that means that although there's a narrative structure and students may become interested in the story, they're not going to see enough Latin to overcome some of the infelicities of the, of the text. Hmm. Hmm. So at least a lot of room for, say, a middle school teacher to uh, devote time to, to toga parties. Yes. And uh, other kind uh, of, yeah. Or funny, my, yeah. my favorite is Fustus Latina. Fustus Latina. <laughs> Well, uh, it's Latin club, right? Fustus is a club. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> oh gosh. That, that's brutal. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. So a club as in, you know, a cudgel, not <laughs> not a, a group gathering. that meets together like a sodalicium <laughs> or something like that. But oh, well, live and learn. We all make some howlers from time to time. I believe that one of your um, teachers, uh, the late uh, Father Reginald Foster, described the Cambridge Latin individuals as balloon-headed. Is that right? <laughs> I think he said melon headed. Melon headed. <laughs> yeah. Melon headed. Right. Yeah, yeah. He had no time for them. Yeah. Mellow capitulated. It's that strange family that you don't want to run into in the in a forest in the middle of a horror movie. No. No. <laughs> and what about the uh, the OLC, the Oxford Latin course? Oh, right, right. So more or less, the same thing can be said of the. Oxford Latin course. It is a reading course that has a limited amount of Latin in it. It has in, interesting culture and pictures, um, and it's it's perfect for younger students who don't have a, a knowledgeable teacher or who need an introduction to language study. And maybe that language is is Latin because they're at a classical school, um, but it's it's unlikely to it's un unlikely to precipitate a serious study of the classics. Now it's, it's it strikes me as kind of. Um... As odd, you know, what, you know. So when I hear the the names Cambridge and Oxford, my immediate assumption is like this is going to be very erudite. Your pinky goes up. It does as you grip the teacup. As the am teacup, I right? exactly right. Of course. But from what we've been talking about, it seems like in some ways quite the opposite. That's right. This is very low level. It yes. seems like it, this is a really good marketing strategy, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah no doubt. Yeah, without it's a doubt. It's more rudite than erudite, perhaps. It, yes, 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 very good. Yes. Well, we don't want to leave on. out uh, Eke Romani, do we? No, although I don't know a whole lot about it. It's a, look, Romans, it's a very um, popular text, isn't it? That's what I learned from in high school, but I admit I don't remember a thing about it. I suppose it's better than something like Audita Romanos, Listen to the Romans. Or... I haven't heard that part of that no. one. No. I just remember lots of pictures. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ophacita Romanos, Smell the Romans. <laughs> Scratch and sniff? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, Patrick. Go ahead. What do you think about Eka Romani? Ece Romani. Oh, um, it revolves around a, a wealthy family. I think the family are the Cornelii. Does that ring a bell, Jeff? That sounds about right. Yes. Um, yeah. And they live in Campania. And so they're they're directly affected by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Um, and now, now that now that I come to think about it, I think um, this is the, the text that... Father Reginald Foster referred to as melon heads because he would, he would talk about <laughs> melon heads in Pompeii. And these are the melon heads in Pompeii. The pictures show each one of the characters having a football sized head. Mm -hmm. And um, there isn't very much action in the story. If I recall correctly, at one point, they their hand cart gets stuck in a ditch and they oh, remain yes. in that ditch for four chapters, which yes. might be a, a little bit too long to keep the interest of uh, middle schoolers who mm. already are, are not thrilled that they have to take Latin. Yeah, I remember I remember thinking, there's no way this family survived the eruption. There's no way. They can't, they can't get the cart out of the ditch. We, right? should, we should probably back up and speak to our legal team about the things that were said about the Cambridge <laughs> Latin course. Oh, really? Well, I mean, they are purveyors of fine literature, and yeah. uh, they've done me a good turn from time to time, and here we filled their pages with uh, fake melon heads. And, oh, um, yes. So, uh, wrong. Okay, we can... Yes. We, we, it's, it's a retraction. Romani is, yes. is where we find the melon yes. heads. Yes, not okay. the Cambridge Latin okay. course, august and distinguished. Yes, well said, well said. Oh, thank well you. Yep. I don't know, how, how should we describe the characters in the Cambridge text if we're not going to call them melon heads? Uh, don't, I don't, don't we know. need some other less aggressively misshapen there. Okay. I like that. <laughs> right. The LA, the LAMs. There we go. <laughs> okay. So moving right along then, Patrick, you've spent some time uh, on Duolingo and I know Jeff, you have as well I have. Yep. with other languages, but not so much with um, Latin. Mm -mm. And, uh, but I think, I think Patrick, as with most 
as with most subjects, he has a pretty well-developed and strongly stated opinion on uh, Duolingo's uh, Latin offerings. Yeah, I do have uh, I do have an opinion about um, Duolingo. I love Duolingo. I, I absolutely love it. I, uh, I I use it almost every day, and it is a terrific way to waste time. I've I've recently given up Facebook, and now I'm spending twice as much time on Duolingo uh, than I was before. Doing Latin or looking like oh good heavens, the Latin? No. Well, I was evaluating the Latin, but just anyone for... would use use it for Latin. Oh, uh, okay. Di right. So that's the problem. It is it is a, a great way to gamify language learning, um, mm-hmm. or perhaps gamify the mystique around language learning because I'm not sure that anyone actually learns a language with Duolingo, but they learn a lot of vocabulary. Um, they may even learn the sounds of a language. Certainly, it it has in, improved me in a number of languages. But its lang- its Latin system just just isn't built to to bring a person from not knowing Latin to being able to read any Latin because it's created as as a sort of game. And of course, there's a, a secret that we don't want to acknowledge, which is that Latin is, is harder than other languages because it's not spoken. At least it's not spoken readily enough. You, you know, you can you can fiddle around mm-hmm. on Duolingo for 45 minutes a day for a year. And then it in fact you can go to Paris and you can order a croissant in French and you will get it right. And yeah. And you can even make change then in French. Um, but you know, learning to 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 order a Big Mac in Latin, no matter how cool some people might think that is, it's it's just not going to get you to a place where you can read any meaningful text or any any text that that people who study Latin generally want to read. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's not it's not a it's not a program that has the substructure necessary for a literary language. It is a, a system that's built for a co- colloquial language and for colloquial recognition more than mm. anything else. Mm-hmm. Right. And I'm not sure how valuable colloquial recognition is for Latin. Hmm. Let's, let's back up on those Big Macs for a moment, though, <laughs> because if, if I'm not mistaken, in Aeneid 5 which are the funeral games for uh, Pot- Potter and Kisses. Mm-hmm. I-, I think it's Mezentius. I'm trying to remember. I, it, maybe it's Mezentius is in the, um, is in the yacht race and he gets thrown on a rock or something and doused in the, in the ocean. And if I'm not mistaken, um, Aeneas spread out a board of Big Macs as the prize for a number of these contests, is that right, Jeff? That's that, that's ringing a bell. Here. Yeah. yeah, exactly. There was a, I I remember it was as combos. Combos. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe not as not as irrelevant. Not as, as irrelevant <laughs> as one might think. So touche. That kind of colloquial you know, stuff aside, I mean, what do you think of just kind of the basic concept of hey, language uh, self study twenty minutes a day? Um, do, do you think that 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 has merit you know, for st- a study of of, of French or of, of Latin as a way of kind of, of uh, a better way to retain or learn a language rather than, you know, an hour and a half in, cl- in class three times a week. Well, I, I hope that the, the 20 minutes that I put towards French on Duolingo every day or every other day means that I'm retaining some of it. I'm certainly not learning anymore. It's not expanding my French. It certainly mm-hmm. isn't expanding my Italian. But yeah. I don't have an opportunity to speak any of those languages on a daily basis. Duolingo and some of the other tools that I have on my smartphone allow me to engage in those languages that I, I wouldn't otherwise be able to engage in, and they prevent those, those language muscles from from atrophying okay. so that's that's a great thing yep. um but you know it, it's it certainly isn't enough to make major gains mm. right so the lofty promises they make on in their ads right. or at least they, they used to yeah is some owl that bugs you and things like that right it comes down to drunken parrots i hear drunken parrots <laughs> there are a lot of drunken parrots in the uh, duolingo uh, Patrick and I have a mutual friend who actually um, was interested in working on the Latin version of Duolingo. I can't say the person's name on the air, but uh, that person would have done a good service. But but uh, wanted to, but did not. So yeah, did not end up working okay. on that yeah. on that particular project. What about Rosetta Stone? Rosetta Stone. Uh, what's your analysis? 
Yes, I did mention Rosetta Stone at one point. I am very impressed with the more recent version of Rosetta Stone. I don't remember if it's version four uh, or what the number is, but I at one point was gifted a Rosetta Stone version one and version two in Latin, and it was abysmal. Not only were there problems, there were basic typos, and it wasn't a system that was conducive for learning Latin, and maybe it wasn't conducive for learning modern languages either. I don't know. But the the more recent, which is the only one that's available for sale now from uh, Rosetta Stone, is really excellent. That is, the, the language that's presented is clear. It is idiomatic Latin. It is organized in such a way that the learner does progress to more and more complicated structures. It's 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 not for free. I think it it's something like 150 bucks now, which is much less expensive than it was years ago. And so it's it's something to to check out, especially for homeschooling families who don't have someone at home who who knows Latin and maybe don't want to spend money to to take a a, a great course over the web with a, mm. a tutor or yeah, I was going to work up to that. So maybe they they for whatever reason can't can't work with uh, Latin per diem or with David Noe over over the web. Maybe they're in Australia and their and their schedules just don't work out. Right. Uh, R- Rosetta Stone would be an option, not the best mm-hmm. option, but a a an introduction to Latin that could work. Hmm. Okay. Said said quid de inciis hamburgensibus censeitis. Uh, quid quid ipse censeo de inciis hamburgensibus. Inciis hamburgensibus censeitis. What do they think about hamburgers in Rosetta Stone? <laughs> uh, if you're getting at the fact that it's still a colloquial approach, you, you're absolutely right. Um, if if you think that being able to order a hamburger in, in Latin is neat, that sort of thing is there. But what's also there is ancient vocabulary. Uh, unlike, okay. say, Duolingo, the vocabulary that is presented in Rosetta Stone is much more authentic, much more mm-hmm. original. And it's it's pretty well crafted. Excellent. So shall we move on, Jeff, to um, we have two more in this series. We've mm-hmm. got the Asa Latinitatis yes. of uh, Father Reginald Foster. And then, of course, the P.S. de la Resistance, just to throw in a little Spanish, <laughs> is um, the Lingua Latina per se illustrata. Yes. So, Patrick, uh, you were a, uh, a, a friend and mentee of uh, Father Foster. Can you tell us about the Asa Latinitatis? I think this is kind of making a bit of a splash among some Latin teachers and um, aficionados. What, what are your thoughts on the text thus far? You're, you're right, David. Father Reginald Foster was my, my mentor and a friend and a wonderful teacher. I'm truly blessed to have studied with him and and carried on a long friendship with him. And I miss him very much. His teaching style has been described as unique, one of a kind, life-changing. And I think those are apt descriptions of what he was like in the classroom. It's difficult to distill a dynamic teacher into pages of a textbook. Some of the ways that Reginaldus approached Latin were idiosyncratic and that extends especially to the eschewing of grammatical vocabulary that is um, very precise. I'd say the eschewing of grammatical jargon in place of simple descriptions of what things are or the use of number systems instead of, say, tenses. And it's it's difficult to see the application of Osa Latinitatis in a classroom of middle school students or or high school students certainly because it doesn't have some of the some of the luster that the texts that we described most recently have like Eke Romani or the the Cambridge text what it does have is a a profound insight into the inner workings of the of the language. It's a text that I've picked up a number of times and have been surprised at how clear the articulations and the descriptions of the language are. In a couple of circumstances, I've found that I've, I've learned something from, from reading his notes there. And I, I think, I, I dare to say almost all of us will, perhaps all of us have something to learn by picking up Osa Latinitatis and, and reading it through. I'm unlikely to use it in the classroom. Um, it, it's a it's a serious tome. 
I don't know that I'll be comfortable using it as an, as an instrument like that, but I, I, I do, and I would continue to recommend it to my students and my colleagues as a sort of reference text or a, a text with which one can hone one's conception of the language. Um, a, a colleague asked me recently whether I believed it could be used productively in one of our classrooms here at the college. And I responded that, um, that it could, it absolutely could. And in fact, the, the method is the best method in the world, as long as the person using it is Reginald Foster. Mm. And when it's not Reginald Foster, there, there's, there's something maybe missing. Mm. That's going to narrow the sales considerably, <laughs> I think. Yeah, no doubt. M- maybe so. Maybe so. I do recommend it to your listeners who already know a great deal of Latin. Right. Um, because as I said, I'm, I'm learning from it myself and, mm-hmm. and I think we can all learn something from it. I have a copy and I'm working through it page by page and have been for some time for uh, precisely the reasons you mentioned. Hmm. It is quite insightful. All kidding aside, every time you said a shoe, I wanted to offer you a tissue or something. But <laughs> Oh, no, I, I, I hoped we were going to delete one of those issues. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have issues with it afterward, I'm sure. Uh, so, Winkle, this brings us down to Lingua Latina per se illustrata. And Which I, is your, your personal It favorite. is mine, okay. yes, and I think it might be Patrick's as well. Okay. We probably should say that it really has nothing to do with the fact that Hackett Publishing... Uh, is the owner of this imprint. It's just a happy coincidence. It is. Okay. Um, but I honestly, I was drawn to Hackett because they they put out this fantastic text. So Patrick, can you share a little bit of your thoughts about this text? Do you remember what your first exposure to it was? Why uh, you have taught from it um, on multiple occasions, as I understand? I would like to second your point that our endorsement of this text has nothing to do with the underwriting of this blog by Hackett because I'm not getting any of that money and uh, I, they're not giving me anything to support. Right. There's, there's, there's no blog. I don't, what is, what is <laughs> Oh, not blog. What is this thing called? His, his, the great, podcast? his hey. great Latin learning has driven him mad. <laughs> Movie? It's a podcast. A podcast. Yes. yes. Okay. So lingua Latina per se illustrata. Fantastic text. Because oh, we have to describe it. We have to go. Into yes, it. Yeah. yes. <laughs> Lingua Latina per se illustrata is unlike any of the other texts that we've described thus far. It is a direct method, or a natural method, or a active language approach to Latin learning, wherein students see from the beginning of the text to the end only Latin. Unlike other language textbooks, the vocabulary isn't presented with English and Latin equivalencies. Rather, students are led from very simple sentences. I believe the first sentence of the first chapter is Roma in Italia est. Indeed. Simple sentences like that, all the way through selections of Catullus, Marshall, Horace, Mm -hmm. all in one textbook. And between the beginning and and the the end is a marvelous story that reads like a novella Mm -hmm. that is at times gripping and at times sort of silly. Mm -hmm. Other times quite um, pathetic in the sense of, you know, producing pathos within us, you know, compassion and misery, sadness for the, the plight of the runaway slave made us and you know, some of the other interesting dramatic moments that occur within the story. So nobody's getting, uh, getting their hand carts stuck in a ditch for four chapters? <laughs> no. Okay, all right, all right good. <laughs> there, there's a, is it a Wehetur, Cornelius Wehetur Equo, Cornelius Rides a Horse. Uh, that's just one um, highly idiomatic expression. Hmm. And and the text is, is laced with them all. In fact, I'm not sure I've ever found one expression in the textbook that is not idiomatic. And Patrick's knowledge of Latin exceeds mine, so he'd, he'd be a better judge. But its Latinity is very high. So it's, it's all in Latin, the whole thing yes. is in Latin. So how do you, uh, um, both of you, have, how do you go about you know bringing in the grammatical aspects of it? Mm-hmm. And say, you know, this is a genitive and explaining right. what the genitive. So what, what, how does that work into a text like this? Well, at the end of each chapter, there is a grammatical discussion of Latin concepts in Latin. Hmm. 
And uh, what is that uh, portion entitled? Is it is it simply Grammatica, Patrick? Grammatica Latina. Grammatica Latina. Okay. Right. Yeah. So then there are blanks put in there. So instead of having the entire word filios, it's fili and then a blank, and the student is supposed to add the masculine singular nominative second declension ending filios. Right? Okay. Filios est quintas. Filios est Marcus, etc. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. How effective do you think, Patrick, the, the Grammatica Latina portions have been in your teaching of the text? Well, I don't usually use them. I don't find that they are the best way to to present students with that material. Okay. And they're not really necessary. If students are are working through the text diligently and doing exercises, they really don't need to be told what a genitive is mm-hmm. um, any more than a st- student of English or a, a baby of English needs to be told what a possessive it is. Mm. And it's enough simply to know how the language works. There's a premium placed on grammatical knowledge or what I call meta knowledge, uh, meta linguistic knowledge on classical languages. Like it's somehow important to know what kind of use a particular participle is, whether it's of circumstantial course. or adversative or, but, but really the Roman doesn't make that distinction. The Roman doesn't ask himself or herself what kind of participle was that, or even was that a participle? I I would bet that most Romans lived and died without ever knowing the term participle, participium, mm-hmm. uh, linguistically speaking. They probably didn't even know the parts of the speech, uh, parts right. of speech. So why is it necessary for our students to know such highly grammaticalized or such such highly specialized terminology for grammar, like the different uses of the ablative or different uses of the dative. Right. And so I dispense with that usually. And what that means is I have more time to sp- spend with my students really acquiring the language mm-hmm. than dissecting the language. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, to the extent that I'm able, I follow a similar pattern, and I typically don't assign or read through the Grammatica Latina. And uh, I only use the pensum K, the third of the three pensa, in at the end of each chapter so there's a b and k or a b and c and c is a series of questions in latin which then the students in my course at least are required to answer in latin mm. mm-hmm. um, the i think jeff as a professional illustrator former cartoonist yes i think you would be much appreciative of these uh, individuals as they're illustrated in the story it's quite consistent um hackett now has it in full color which is really nice yeah you know, technicolor. What's the proportion of head size to torso? Small squash, maybe. <laughs> but butternut, I would say. Maybe, butternut, okay. Maybe acorn. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. So I'm intrigued. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Now, how would how do you go uh, with the Texas go about uh, testing your students? Mm-hmm. Well, I'll let Patrick answer this first, and then I, as usual, have some opinions. Sure. That is a good question. There are questions provided by the the text, and in the exercise book that can be used for assessment on a section by section basis. So students can work through one of the three sections, each, each chapter is divided into a section. And then the instructor can determine whether students have, have mastered the material through those sorts of open-ended questions. I, I often will have students summarize in English a, a very large section. So if we finish reading a couple of pages, I'll elicit summaries in English rather than have students translate directly from, from Latin into English. Right. What, what do you think about this idea, Patrick? I often have students, I test them on vocabulary, but I, I try never to go f- from the, the target language to the mother tongue. But instead, I'll give them 30 English words and ask them for the Latin equivalent. I think that's more effective than working in the other direction. Um, and sometimes they don't like my particular Latin construals, <laughs> for example, I guess I should say my English construals. So one important verb in the, in the book is pulso, pulsare, you know, which can mean a, a wide number of things, but in the book, it's often used for knocking on the door, hmm. right? So I, I use that as my English version, right? To knock on a door. Well, of course the word means a lot more things than that, right. but I've keyed it to the context. And so sometimes students can't recognize the particular English I've chosen, oh, uh, I see. so as to figure out well, what, what does he mean, uh, and they eventually get around to it. Gotcha. Hmm. Interesting. 
or have uh, give them a portion of Latin that they've studied, say the beginning of chapter two, which is uh, on the, the Roman family itself. And I'll translate it all into English, a paragraph, and then I'll have them put it back into Latin. Ah, yeah. Um, so as much as possible to work from their their mother tongue and into the target language. Gotcha. Gotcha. Would you, would you say Patrick, there's some merit to that? You know, you can, you can call me out in front of our audience and say deliras, right? You're uh, nuts, I you certainly to. wouldn't say that, uh, you deliras, but I, uh, that is simply not something I do. Not, not for any principled reason. I just, maybe I've never thought of it. Mm -hmm. Rather I, I use other exercises like filling in the blanks or talking about the problems that, the characters are facing certainly creating example sent sentences that are imitative of the text itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, the series of books begins with Familia Romana, um, and then it moves on into the green covered one, which is Roma Eterna, right? Uh, after which there are a lot of supplementary materials, the Fabulae Sirdrae, which were written, if I'm not mistaken, by um, Luigi Miralia. Is that correct, Patrick? Uh, that's partially correct. It was written by a, a number of us at Vivarium Novum. And unless I'm mistaken, my my name is listed yes. among those authors. Hmm. I know you contributed. So, And uh, that text is useful because it is a supplement to Familiar Romana itself, rather than a text that should be read after Familiar Romana. Mm -hmm. So I, I would add that while Familiar Romana, which is the first volume in the Lingua Latina Per Se Illustrata series, is a standalone text, there are these other texts that m amplify the, the virtues of Familiar Romana. There is a text called Colloquia Personarum, which mm -hmm. are dramatic dialogues featuring only the characters from Familiar Romana, such that students already know the, the character. They know what type of person each one of these characters right. is, hmm. and they can then interpret them dramatically through a scene. And yep. that really excites students, especially students in, in middle school and high school. It's like a, if I may, it's like a a sitcom spinoff is what it is. That, really. That's right. That's right. <laughs> when Potsy got his own show temporarily. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Less than a week, I believe. <laughs> yeah, it didn't last long. The textbook long. is Cheers, and uh, Colloquia Personarum is Frasier. Yes. There, there you go. go. Okay, so a successful spinoff. Yes. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, then there are other supplements like the Fabellae Latinae, which are short stories in which no new material is presented. And, and that is really wonderful because that gives students who are maybe struggling to keep up some breathing room. They get more repetitions of the vocabulary mm -hmm. that they've been seeing. They see the same grammatical structures. And so it is engineered in such a way to provide students with more of the same input to create an internal representation of the language in students' minds mm -hmm. in a similar way as babies do in their native tongue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's this has been an excellent episode. Yes. Uh, I think if I don't say so myself, <laughs> I think we need to we need to wrap this up here. You know, we had here on our script, uh, Dr. Winkle, that we were going to ask Patrick some additional questions about Latin pedagogy, ask mm -hmm. him for a, a demonstration of spoken Latinity. What are two or three traits that he thinks would make an ideal Latin teacher? Advice for newbies who are just starting out, either studying Latin or teaching it. But it's clear now that we need to save these topics for... Th those questions alone, I think we could, yes, we could talk for... for the callback. For an hour yes, or more. for about sure. That. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we got we to have Dr. Owens back on. Huh? Yes. Yep. Patrick, would you like to give a valediction of any sort before we uh, we say goodbye and wrap up this episode? I would love to. Vale tote, omnes auditores. There we there go. We go. <laughs> it's it's a, the future imperative there. Vale tote. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. So, so long, all you fine listeners. Uh, actually, technically, there weren't any adjectives in there, but you could throw one in there, couldn't you? Other than omnes. How about, uh, I don't know, eruditissimi or something like that? Mm. So, Mm, sure, yeah. Uh, butter up the listener. Yeah. Butter up the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Keep them coming back for more. 
Of exactly. course. Right. All right. Well, thank you very much, Patrick. And Thank uh, you both. It's a pleasure speaking with you. Yeah. Likewise. Thank you Take so care. much. Well, Jeff, that wraps up this week. We got to get out of here. We do. We got to say some thank yous to the folks that make this possible. Yes. First of all. Thanks our, to Mishka. Yes. Our intrepid sound engineer. She weaves this all together. It's almost magic. It is. We couldn't do it without her. Absolutely. Yep. And also thanks to Ken Tamplin and Scott Menzen for the great music. Yes. That you hear at the beginning, in the middle, at the Some end. Screaming guitar screaming riffs. Screaming guitar. I wish Scott, I could play like that. <laughs> well, I wish I could play the guitar at all. You're, you're quite accomplished, but I have to say, you know Van Zen. I know Van Zen, right? No, so no. He's one of those guys that when I hear him, it's, yeah. like it's inspiring, but also makes you want to quit. Because <laughs> yeah. you can't get there. The guy can play the blues. He's actually coming out with a new album. I think it's an all instrumental album. Really? I can't remember the name. We'll say it on air, but uh, I've been listening to his uh, Without Words, which you can get on Spotify. Hmm. My favorite uh, track on that album is uh, Fremont Street. Fremont Street. Yes. I'll check it out. Because he was out in Vegas. And okay. uh, it's got this great acoustic bridge in it. Just just gorgeous Very stuff. Very cool. Uh, he's, he's phenomenal. Yeah. You know? Uh, Dave, before we go, will you tell us something about the Moss Method? I would love to. You know, this this episode has run a little long, yeah. so I'm not going to spend too much time. I'm not going to dilate on the Moss Method. But we've got some good things coming up this fall. Okay. Uh, we're going to be running office hours, and we're going to have a big fall promotional, a back-to-school special, Great. you might say. Yeah. So go to mossmethod.com, check out some of the new video offerings I'm preparing, and uh, come along with us and learn some Greek. Sounds great. So listeners, uh, shoot us an email, jeff at oddnauseum.com, dave at oddnauseum.com. Um, tell us what you like, what you don't like. Um, it's the best way to get a shout out. Oh, and we love those shout outs. We love those shout outs. What and a great way to connect with people that are actually listening to us. It is great. Us. It's great. So don't hesitate. We love to read it and yeah. we, love, we love to respond. Absolutely. Dave, you got our gustatory party shot, don't you? I do, but Jeff, aren't what? we going to tell them what's coming up next oh, week? sorry, sorry. Exactly. What's coming up? Well, next week we're going to go old school, by which I mean old school comedy. Oh. Yeah. Now this is going to be a stretch for me. It's There's quite a bit of ribaldry in this one that's you're, coming you're up. You're kind of uncomfortable about I am, you know, I don't like to work blue. Okay. Let's be honest. I'm a family man. I know there's a whole world of humor that works on uh, double, on triple entendres Mm -hmm. and so forth. And so I'm a little uncomfortable with that, but we're going to give it a go. It's Aristophanes' oh, Frogs. Yes, the master. Yeah, an original Winkle translation. Yes, in I'm fact. Go- which is, I'm very excited about. So you got to tune in for that. Yes. Okay, now it's time for the party It's shot. time. Okay. All right, so this comes from Ben Scott. Jeeves and the Leap of Faith is mm. the name of the, the work. And Ben Scott says, as Sherlock Holmes once observed, when you've excluded the inevitable, whatever remains, however unpalatable, must be lunch. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks for listening.